Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us today. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 1. If you follow along on your phone, you can do that. Or you can just look on the screens. They'll be up there. The verses will be up there in just a moment. Well, I want to say this before we get started. I really appreciate our worship team and uh, all those in our tech team. I love the uh, acoustic set that they did today. Let's give them a hand for a great job. And um, I really felt led into worship today, and I thought that was fantastic. Just a comment about uh, what Brian said, uh, the devotions uh, from this campaign. I've been reading them every day this week, and it's very interesting because uh, you know the story of how uh, God used the Israelites to give to be able to build the tabernacle. The interesting thing about this is that just a very short period of time before they began to give their offering, do you know what they were? They were slaves. They had no income. And God provided for them. And that, I think, illustrates to us that it's not how much we have. It's about our heart. It's not about our ability to give. It's about our availability. And I really believe that God blesses uh, when, we, when we do that. And so I'm very, very thankful uh, for what you do and how that you follow in faith what God has led you to do as well. Well, today I want to talk to you about doing our part requires faith. And I'm going to read to you today uh, from what is called the Faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews chapter 11. Now, when we say hey, Faith Hall of Fame, that just simply means that there's a lot of stories in Hebrews chapter 11 about real people that did real things, that faced real problems, and in their faith, God rewarded them. And we're going to read the first uh, oh, uh, eight or so verses. It says uh, 1 through 16 on here, but we're going to read uh, in depth on the first eight or so verses. So begin reading with me in Hebrews chapter 1, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. God does not expect you to go in blindly and trust him. He wants to give you assurance. Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in the message today. The fact is, God will give you assurance about what he wants you to do. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the people of old received their commendation. In other words, their commendation from God. It's one thing to have a commendation from a coworker or your boss or the pastor or your spouse, and it's a totally different thing to have a commendation from God. I don't know how you live your life, but I believe that we all as believers should live our lives with this one goal in mind, that when we go and stand before God in our time when our life here on this earth is ended, before we're resurrected uh, from the grave to be reunited for eternity, to be with God, I believe we should live with this one thing in mind, to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. God doesn't say well done because you had a lot of money. God doesn't say well done because you had a lot of talent. He said, well done. He says, well done because we are faithful. And so God will commend us for that. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. There are some things that are not visible that are more powerful than the things you can see. By faith, Abel. Offer to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. If you know the story from the book of Genesis, Cain and Abel, how that Cain became jealous of Abel and he killed his brother. Well, it's because he offered a more acceptable sacrifice to God through which he was commended as righteous. Once again, this was because of his faith, not because of his deeds, not because of his actions, not because of his talent, not even because of his offering, but because of his faith. He trusted God. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Have you noticed how many times the word commendation or commended is being used here? God commends people. God rewards people. God is impressed by people that have faith. 
that act on that faith. Well, it goes on and says, without faith, it is impossible to please him or God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe. And that's one of the things I want you to see today. If you're going to be close to God, if you're going to have a good relationship with God, if you're going to grow in your relationship with God, there's one thing you must do. You must believe. You must have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You know, there are a lot of Christians, a lot of people who believe God exists. In fact, if you even ask most people on the street in our country today, the vast majority would say they believe in God. Oh, there's a small segment of atheists, that's for sure. And uh, some people say that's a growing segment. I'm not so sure if it is or not. But I do know this. The majority of the people believe that God exists. If you ask them if God is in charge, if God created things, they would say yes. But I'm not quite so sure that everybody believes the second part of that. You got to believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. In other words, if you come and you come before God and you pray and you say, God, I want to know you, God says he will answer that prayer. And that's good news. I don't know about you, but there have been so many times in my life that I've needed him, that I've cried out to him, and the Bible tells us that he hears our prayers. Now, don't get that mixed up and think that that means that there are no problems in life, that God doesn't need to be with you during the dark nights. David wrote in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me me. Can you imagine anything greater, anything more powerful, anything more stabilizing than the fact that God is with you? No matter what you face, you might get fired tomorrow, but guess what? God is with you. You may lose your mother or your father or a spouse or a child uh, in, in the upcoming days, but guess what? God is with you. You may have a bad report from the doctor, but guess what? God is with you. You may feel depressed and lonely and all alone in life, but guess what? You are not alone. Why? Because God is with you. And no matter what you face, no matter what valley you go through, when you believe in him, when you have faith, God is with you. And I love that. And the Bible says that there's a, a dual thing you've got to believe. You not only believe that he exists. Oh, that's not too hard to believe. Oh, God, yeah, he creates things. Yeah, the Bible says God loves me. But the problem is when it becomes personal. You see, we can all believe that God loves the world. We see evidence of that, we can say, well, yeah, God loves that person or God loves the church. But when it comes down to it in your darkest moments, do you believe that God loves you? When it comes down to those challenging moments in those trials in your life, do you truly believe that God is with you? You see, when you do that, when you begin to believe not just that he exists, but that he is there with you, it's a game changer. It changes everything because then you'll know that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Well, I just want to give you a few thoughts today about what real faith does. You see, real faith, according to the Bible, according to what Jesus said, it doesn't have to be huge to start out with. In fact, Jesus said, if you'll have faith like a grain of mustard seed. He did not say the size of a grain of mustard seed. He said, like a grain of mustard seed. Now, it is small, but you know what a mustard seed is known for? It's known for growing from a tiny, tiny little seed into a large plant, into something that flourishes. And I believe this is what Jesus is telling us. Your faith doesn't have to be that big to begin with. You may not have the practice or the spiritual maturity yet to trust God in everything. And I gotta be honest with you, there are many times that I have doubted. Now, I'm a man of faith. I have committed my life to the word of God and to leading people uh, into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've committed myself, my entire life, to teaching and preaching the word of God and, and showing people the way, pointing people to Jesus. 
And there have been times in my life that God has just blown me away with how he's answered prayer, the faith that I had, what little it may have been, God rewarded so greatly. But even in that, the fact that I've been doing this for a long time now, there are times when I struggle. There are times that the old devil will whisper into my ear, oh, that's not going to happen. Oh, he's not going to answer that prayer. Oh, that's too much. You're expecting too much. But oh, when God begins to reward our faith, there are times that we have to be like the man that Jesus spoke to in the New Testament, in the Gospels. The man looked at him. He said, Lord, I believe. Jesus said to him, if you'll believe, anything is possible. He said, Lord, I believe, but you help my unbelief. And that is a prayer that each of us must pray. Because having faith like a grain of mustard seed doesn't mean that it's always a gigantic faith. What it means is that it's a growing faith. And God will reward your faith when you trust him. Well, what does real faith do? Number one, faith believes even when you don't see it. Even when you don't see it. How many times in our life do we have to have real faith? By the way, if you can see it, it doesn't require a lot of faith, does it? If my bank account is always full, doesn't require a lot of faith for God to supply my needs, I say, you know what, I got this, God. I'm pretty much self-reliant. What a horrible place to be, not having money in the bank, but saying that you depend on yourself rather than God. What does real faith do? Well, it believes even when you don't see it. Verse 1, he said, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Even though you may not see it yet, through the eye of faith, you can. Assurance means having confidence in God. That's all it means. When he says you can have the assurance of things hoped for, it means that maybe you're not that big, but you know that God is. Maybe you can't solve all your problems, but you know that God can. Maybe you don't have all the answers to life, but you know that God does. And there is where faith comes in. It's the assurance, meaning having confidence in God. It means to place under something, in this case, God. So when I'm having faith in God, you know what I'm doing? I'm saying to God, Lord, I don't know how this is going to end up. I know what my faith is. I know what I'm praying, God. But you know what, Lord? I'm going to surrender myself to you. I'm going to surrender this situation to you. I'm going to surrender this circumstance to you. Lord, I may not have all control, but I know you do. And so it's an assurance. It is surrendering to God. It it requires that I surrender my thinking, my fears, and my doubts to God. You and I must practice that. The word conviction, uh, he said there, you can have the conviction of things not seen. It means that I have confidence because of the evidence. Think of the many ways that God has provided, not just for you, but for this church in the past. I like to tell people this story that um, Avalon Church, uh, when we, before we became Avalon Church, our name was Horizon Point Church. When we first started this church in 2001, our name was Horizon Point. And we changed the name when we moved here because this area is called Avalon. There was nothing, wasn't based on King Arthur's legend or anything like that. I had somebody uh, write to me and said, you know that Naming your church after King Arthur's legend is, uh, you know, kind of cultish, and that's not Christian. I'm like, yeah, but naming it after the little city that we're in or the street that we're on is okay, right? Well, when we began to move from the building that we owned and move into this place, it was just a miracle how God began to provide for us. And and we needed $450,000. We had raised money, but we needed $450,000 that we were going to borrow from the bank. We went to the bank, and we had no collateral. And they said, good luck, you know, and uh, pretty much refused us. But I'll never forget one day. We were praying. We prayed as a church that God would provide the need. And one day, a man who was a friend of mine that owned a bar, he walked up to me I never asked him about this. I never told him about this. I never suggested anything like this to him. He said, hey, I heard that you need uh, some collateral for uh, your church to be built out. I said, yeah, we do. He said, well, he said, you know, if you don't mind, he said, I'd like to put my bar up as collateral for your church. 
And I said, let me pray about that. Yes, thank you so much. We were able to pay that off in a fairly short period of time. But I love telling people that uh, Avalon Church was financed by a bar. And that's why we have so many drunks in our church. So I'm just kidding about that part. But the, the being financed by a bar part is real. Now, can you imagine a, be- a better story than that? Can you imagine more of a God story than that? Nobody won the lottery. Uh, Nobody had a rich uncle that died and left them millions of dollars. But a bar from a man that was not even a believer came up and put that up to build this church out. Amazing. God does amazing things. You see, faith believes even when you don't see it. And I can promise you that there are going to be obstacles to what we're doing. Oh, there already are. The past year, can you imagine that in the past year, we have been, I believe, under attack from the enemy, and we have been isolated. We have had so many of our faithful people. Let me just say to those of you that are a part of our church online, you join us every week. I love you. I thank God for you. I thank God for the opportunity that we have through technology to be able to meet with you. But man, there are so many of you that I miss seeing your beautiful face. And there's so many of you that are coming back. And, I, and you know, not that you left, but you're starting to be able to come back now. The last year, and I got to tell you this, and I believe this, when you go through that, it's discouraging. The truth is, when you face something like this, you don't have answers. You don't even know if what you're doing is successful or not because you've never been through something like that. And that's true for many of you and your family and your job And even in your own emotions, there have been many of you that have been attacked in your emotions. You've been discouraged and depressed. I've seen it in our church. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it among our staff. We talk about this quite a bit, about how that the past year has been something that we've never faced before. Well, many of you know about my struggle with my health, about, uh, you know, starting back in July of last year of beginning to get worse and worse and worse and going through uh, dozens of, of doctors and spending tens of thousands of dollars trying to get an answer. Back in October and November of this past year, I was bedridden, could not get out of bed. And I got to be honest with you, and I've never really told anybody this besides my wife, I didn't know if I was going to make it. I thought I was going to die. I really did. I had begun to make plans in my mind about passing off leadership in this church and what was going to happen with my wife and my beautiful family. But thank God, you prayed for me. People all across this world have been praying for me. And uh, ever since then, I've just been getting better and better and better and better. Now, I hope what you get from that story is not anything about me, but it's all about Jesus. Jesus. And it's all about prayer. It's all about how you and I are able to have faith and trust God. Well, the second thought is this. Faith trusts God's promises and power. It doesn't trust a person. It trusts, well, Jesus is a person. But it trusts Jesus. It doesn't trust someone like me. Even though the Bible is very clear, the Apostle Paul said, uh, be followers of me as I am followers of Christ. One of of my jobs as a pastor is to point you to Jesus, is to show you how to walk and follow him. Not that I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. Uh, I make mistakes every day of my life. But I, I can tell you this, with all of my heart, as best as I can, the, the entirety of my life since I committed my life to Jesus Christ, and I've failed and I've, I've, I've fallen short, but there have been so many times that I've said, you know what I'm going to do in my life? I may not be successful in the eyes of the world. I may not ever be rich, but I'm going to do my best to follow Jesus. And that is what you and I can do. That is how that we can do what God has called us to do. In the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of doubts, in the middle of discouragement, we can trust God. Faith trusts God and his promises and his power. 
Look at what it says in verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that which was seen was not made out of things that are visible. I don't know if you really get that verse or not. But the fact is it just shows the incredible power of God. Everything in this universe. The stars. The billions and billions of stars. There are even billions of galaxies they say. It was all created by the word of God. He spoke it and it happened. Genesis 1 chapter 3 talks about that first day of creation. You know what God did on that first day? He said, let there be light. And the universe exploded into place. Incredible his power. If he has that kind of power over the elements... If he can create something from nothing, where nothing existed before, and he made it just simply by the word of his mouth, how much can you and I trust him with our little problems? How much can you and I trust him with our little world? Oh, the fact is he's great. We can trust his powerful. The most powerful things in the world are not visible, but they are real. For example, the most powerful force in the universe And we find this according to scripture. Read the book of Song of Solomon. The Bible says that love is stronger than death. Think about that. That is the one thing in all of our lives that is inevitable. It's stronger than even taxes. (laughs) You know, they say there are two things that are inevitable, death and taxes, right? Well, according to the word of God, the most powerful force in the universe is love. But it's not seen You don't walk into a store and say, I'd like a little bit of love, please. You don't walk into a car dealership and say, you know what I need? I need some love with this car. We don't do that. Why? Because that's not really how it exists. You don't see it. You don't see it on a shelf. You don't buy it on Amazon. But you sure do know that it's there. You sure do know that it's real. You sure do know that God loves you, that you've experienced love in your life. It's incredible. Often we cannot see with the physical eye what is much more real than what we can see with the physical eye. And I like to say it this way, faith trumps reality. That's what the Word of God teaches us. Faith trumps reality. What is the reality of your world? Maybe you're in the midst of problems. Maybe you're in the midst of a pandemic. Maybe you're in the midst of a financial downturn. Maybe you're in the midst of a, of a health problem. Faith trumps reality. And you and I can trust God for that. Third thing I want you to see is that faith gives. Verse four, by an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. And notice, it was what he believed, not what he brought that made the difference. It's what he believed, not what he brought that made the difference. And I can tell you this, the same is true for your life and for mine. It's what we believe that matters, not what we bring. It's what we believe and trust God for. Number four, faith pleases God. If you want to know how to please God, it's not through keeping the Ten Commandments. We've talked about that a lot. You should keep the Ten Commandments. Don't go out of here and say, Pastor Richie said we shouldn't keep the Ten Commandments, so I'll go steal something uh, this afternoon. No, the Bible says thou shalt not steal. Don't steal. It says, don't murder. It says, don't be covetous. And we could go down the list. But listen, that's not how you please God. It is through the grace of Jesus Christ that we're able to please God. It is through the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross. And when we believe that, it makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I want to remind you today that this campaign that we're doing, there's really only one reason. It's not because of finances, though we're going to be better off investing into something that we own rather than leasing something that we don't own. We're going to be better off in the long run, building uh, the campus that we believe God's going to give us, uh, building uh, the buildings that we believe God is going to let us build, reaching people uh, in ways that we never were able to before because of the tools that God has given us. But never mistake why we're doing what we're doing. It's not because of a building. It's because of reaching people. 
It's because of the gospel. Our desire is to spread the good news of Jesus around the world. And it's through that that we can be confident that God will bless our faith. So don't ever get this confused. It's not about bricks and mortar. It's about people. Um, Oftentimes we refer to a building as the church. And technically we should say that that's the church building because the church is not made of bricks and mortar. The church is made of people. Look around. This is the church. Those of you online, you're connected. This is the church. And so that is why we do what we do. Number five, faith obeys even if you don't understand. Verse number seven, it says, it was by faith that Noah built an ark to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about something that had never happened before. I got to tell you, if you're going to have something that has never happened before in your life, you got to have faith like you've never had before. And if we want to see a move of God, then, then not just move, like is said on the screens last Sunday, we don't want to just move, we want to see a move of God. That's what we want. That's what I believe God will do for us. Uh, you've got to do or have faith like you've never had before if you're going to see God do something that he's never done before. Hebrews 11 verse 8, in that next verse, it was by faith that made Abraham obey when God called him out uh, to go to a country that God had promised to him. He left his own country without knowing where, there he, where he was going. Sometimes we have to take a step of faith. You know, the truth is, um, if you had everything worked out, if you knew the answer to every question, it wouldn't require faith, would it? But God rewards our faith. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 2 and 3, they are being tested by many troubles. Can anybody say amen to that right there? Anybody been tested by many troubles in the last year? Can I get a witness here today? Somebody say amen. Somebody clap their hands. Somebody give me a little noise. Let me know that I'm still awake. The fact is, we've been tested by many troubles. Our staff has been tested by many troubles. Our elders have been tested by many troubles. You have been tested by many troubles. And with that comes the temptation to doubt at times. Well, I wonder if this is going to be right. I wonder if this is worth it. I wonder if this is going to work out. And the truth is, we are being tested by many troubles. In, the, in first, 2 Corinthians 8, I'm going to preach about, uh, from this text next week. But um, it says that this church was very poor. They were very poor. But they're also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed in rich generosity. Can I tell you this? The more you get your eyes on Jesus, the more faith you have in him, the more joy you're going to have, and the more you're going to be generous. Not just with your resources, your time, your talent, your family. You're going to be generous. You're going to be generous with others and helping others. It says, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. And I hope this is going to be true of me and of you. The fact is, when we trust God, it doesn't matter how much we have because God doesn't really judge us by what we have or what we don't have, but by what we do have. He's not going to hold you accountable for what you don't have. You've always said, we've heard people say this, boy, I tell you what, if I had her money, oh, I'd give that church, I tell you what. Well, if you don't give on your money, you probably wouldn't give if you had her money. <laughs> I tell you what, boy, if I won that lottery, pastor, and I've heard this many times. Um, boy, I tell you what, if I won that lottery, you ain't going to have to ever worry about anything for building the church. Well, I don't have to worry about anything with building the church anyway because God is in control. And the fact is we can trust him. And uh, if you do win the lottery, you better tithe. That's all I'm saying, all right? So, uh, or I'm going to pray down a curse on you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 8, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will reap generously, and God will generously provide all you need. 
Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Man, if you can be in that position, what a great place to be in your life. Trusting God. God is the one that supplies our need. Then this is the last thought and we're done. Faith embraces God's eternal purpose. Hebrews 11, 26 and 27, Moses looks steadily at the ultimate, not the immediate reward. The ultimate, not the immediate reward. By faith, he led the exodus from Egypt. He defied the king's anger with the strength that came from obedience to the invisible king. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I can do great things if we will obey the invisible king. Moses did what was impossible. An entire nation that depended on the work of an entire group of people. Probably three million Jewish people in slavery in Egypt. Can you imagine any king letting that just go? Not only did he let it go, but the Egyptians gave them their gold and their jewels and their silver. They, were, they gave them this so that God could use it for his glory. And what you and I need to understand is that we need to live for the ultimate, not the immediate reward. If I live my life in light of eternity, if I look at my finances in light of what God wants to do in reaching people with the good news of Jesus, if I live my life believing what the word of God says, that I can lay up treasures for myself in heaven. Doesn't matter who you are, how much you have here on this earth, they, they rust, they, they decay, they deteriorate. They cannot save you. No matter how many billions of dollars you may have, it will not get you one more moment of life than what God has planned for you. It'll not get you one breath in heaven just because you're rich. The fact is, you and I need to live for the ultimate rather than the immediate. And when we begin to do that, God blesses us. Obey the invisible king. I, I said that was the last point. There's one more. Faith trusts God for something better. And, and I'll read this and we're done. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. Uh, they were all, all the people in this chapter. They were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better. Can I just tell you what that means? It means that they didn't know that Jesus was coming. They knew that God was their Savior. They knew that they could trust in Him. And the things they were wanting, the things they were hoping for, were not good enough. Can I tell you this? The things that you and I want in life, oftentimes are simply not good enough. You say, wait a minute, does that mean I need to buy a bigger house? No, that's not what I'm saying. The fact is, God knew that Jesus was coming. God knew that one day that our faith would be rewarded. God knew that one day his grace would be poured out because of what Jesus did on the cross. God had something better planned for them. And I gotta tell you that you may be today you're in that predicament. Maybe you've been praying for something. Maybe you've been hoping for something. And it's not good enough. God wants something better for you. He, he has bigger plans than you do. He has better sight than you do. He sees farther down the road than you do. Oh, thank God when he does not answer my prayer. Because oftentimes those prayers that I pray they're going to hurt me. The ones that he doesn't answer, well, he answers, he just says no. God, understand this. God answers prayers by saying yes or no or wait. And sometimes it's not the right timing. And yet God will eventually give us something better. And that's what God wants for your life and for mine. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us today to want something better. Something that you have promised God, help us to trust in you, even when we don't understand. I pray for our church, God, that you would encourage our leadership, encourage those that are members of our church, encourage those that are just coming to our church and they're not quite involved yet, encourage those that are not here yet. And God, I pray that you'd help us to have faith to obey the invisible king. God, sometimes the things we see in front of us are not the reality. Well, they may be reality, but faith trumps 
reality. And God, help us to embrace that and to believe it. For us in Jesus' name, I pray. Before I finish my prayer, those of you online and those of you in the room today, do you need to know Jesus as your Savior? I always try to give that opportunity because I know that there are always some, there's always somebody that's watching. Always somebody that needs Jesus. Maybe you would say today is the day that I need to give my life to Christ. Why don't you pray something like this and understand that it's not a, a prayer that saves you, but it's an act of faith, of trusting God. Pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you resurrected from the grave so that I could be made right with the Father. And right now I pray that you would save me, that you'd make me to be born again, that you would help me to love and follow you with all of my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer online, please click the button below to let us know that you received Christ today. If you're here in the room, please fill out the next step card and let us know that you trusted Christ today. Maybe today you're praying about doing your part. We're talking about this. I pray that you will trust God by faith to do something that he's never done through you before and to bless you in ways that he's never blessed you before. And I believe if we will pray that and trust God for that, that he will hear and answer our prayers. Just look right this way for a moment. Um, If you're new to Avalon Church, you've never filled out a Next Step card, please fill out one for us today and drop it in the drop box on the way out. Uh, That way you don't have to touch anyone or anything. And so if you are comfortable with handing it to one of our people at Next Step Central, you can do that as well. But fill that out for us. Let us know how to connect with you. Uh, We are going to be having baptism next week. One of the things that you can do on the Next Step card is sign up for baptism. So today, if you said, I would like to be baptized next Sunday, then fill out this card and drop it in the box. Um, And, you know, you can go to the Next Step class. We have the Next Step class today. We're going to do it uh, the third Sunday of May, the third Sunday of May, which I believe is the 16th. And so uh, you, can, uh, you can sign up for that as well in the next step and take your next step. Uh, next Sunday, I'm sorry, uh, May the 9th is uh, Mother's Day. Don't forget that. And you can also use the next step card to sign up for child dedication. Now we're offering that. If no one takes advantage of it, then that's fine. But if you would like to dedicate your child to the Lord, then uh, you can fill that out with a next step card as well. And so don't don't miss that as well. I'm going to ask um, Chelsea and Jimmy McDonald, if they would, to come onto the stage. I believe they're uh, in here somewhere uh, waiting. Are they? Do I see Chelsea? And I answer. I ask that question, and uh, I don't see her because I can't hardly see anything anyway. I'm standing up here looking out in the crowd. Uh, is Jimmy and Chelsea, where are they? We'll give them a minute to get on up here to the stage, but let me, while they're doing this, remind you of a couple things. Um, tom- starting tomorrow at noon and at 7 o'clock p.m., we're going to have a prayer meeting. We're praying for the campaign that we're doing, and uh, if you'd like to be able to drop by and um, pray at any time during the 12 o'clock hour or the 7 o'clock hour. And we're going to just have that for uh, an hour, 12 to 1 and 7 to 8. So it's not going to be longer. You don't have to be here the entire time. But if you'd like to drop by the church and pray, we're going to be doing that for the next uh, four Monday nights. And so I hope you'll take advantage of that and uh, be a part of our prayer meeting as we pray. And even if you can't make it, Uh, during that time. I hope you will pray at home or wherever you are um, uh, for our church and for the Doing Our Part uh, campaign, okay? All right, let me go ahead and uh, and, uh, just address uh, this. Um, Nearly two years ago, over a year and a half ago, um, Chelsea, uh, you guys come on, uh, come on the stage. Uh, Chelsea uh, came to our church and uh, man, what a vision she had and what a what a great uh, employee she's been at our church. And um, she, I believe, led our children's ministry through the most difficult time that we've ever experienced as a church. You guys come on over here. And um, she led our church through the most difficult period of time in our children's ministry, in history. Um, 
not only did we reduce the number of services that we had, but we lost many volunteers. Not that we lost them permanently, but that they weren't able to come or they were uh, afraid with their children that they were not able to come. And she led our church carrying a tremendous, tremendous burden in ways that I don't believe we've ever had a children's pastor carry. And uh, there is no doubt she did a phenomenal job during that time. And one of the great things, uh, having moved here to Avalon Church, she was single when she moved here, and she is married now. And uh, you may be saying, well, did she really get that much when she got Jimmy? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know this. I've been so proud of not only Chelsea, but I've been so proud of Jimmy. Jimmy's been a member of our church for a very long time. And I've told him more than once in the last few months of how proud I am of him, of how much he has grown, how much he's just responsibility he's taken on. And uh, man, uh, what a beautiful, wonderful couple that has been such a tremendous blessing to our church. Well, many of you know that today is Chelsea's last Sunday as an employee of Avalon Church. She believes that God is moving her on and that they are seeking God's will about things. But we could not be happier, number one, for their service, and number two, uh, for especially for Chelsea, of what she has led our church through in such a difficult, difficult time. And I believe she's done a phenomenal job, maybe a job that nobody else could have done, that she was here specifically for that, that God used her specifically uh, for that purpose. And I want you to know that we love you. We're so proud of you. We're so proud of you, Jimmy. And we just want you to know that uh, Avalon Church embraces you and loves you. And we are very, very thankful that God allowed you to be a part of our lives. Do we believe that, church? Can we let them know that we love them? Come, Come over here. Heavenly Father, I pray now for Jimmy and Chelsea. Lord, what a beautiful, wonderful couple. God, thank you so much for what you are doing in their lives. Thank you for how you're leading them. I pray that you just bless them in this next phase of their life. I pray that you bless Avalon Church in the next phase of our ministry as we uh, have our plans and and our vision of what you want us to do. God, I pray now that you just bless this couple, bless them in, in ways that we can't even imagine, use them in ways that we can't even imagine at this point and that they don't even understand yet. And God, we thank you for them. God, most of all, be with them. We know that you love them. Embrace them. Put your arms around them and let them know how much you love them. And God, let them know how thankful we are for them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Can we give them a hand? God bless you guys. Thank you so much. I hope that you'll, um, you'll come speak to them and everything. It doesn't move, mean they're moving out of the area or anything. God's just leading them to a different phase of, of ministry in their life at this point. So, but just come by and say hi to them. Let them know that you're very thankful for what they do and for them specifically. Well, let's everyone stand together. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Don't forget on the way out, we're going to hand out a brochure doing our part with all of our heart. Make sure you pick up one of these. Make sure you read the devotions uh, every day. I've been reading them every day this week. God's blessed me and, uh, encourage me for it. I hope you'll make sure to read those as well. I want you to know I love you. Thank you for being here today. God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.